the book takes place in the future. Uh, things are a little different. It's about a thousand years in the future. And uh, the book's about a uh, kind of life of a criminal overlord. And uh, the scene I'm going to read is uh, from when he is a teenager, sort of trying to make a run at the, uh, the criminal hierarchy where he's from, he's trying to start, start an empire. <clears throat> it's called The Road Trip Chapter. He left that afternoon. Didn't tell Uncle Antonio or Maria or anybody other than Diego and Fernando who went with him. Just left. Fernando and Diego did not need much convincing. They'd follow him anywhere. When they got on the road, the day had become bright and sunny and good. Junior floored the car company red sports car he stole from the overnight parking garage at the airport and fueled with ethanol paid for with the sale of the gun he was supposed to deliver to expensive hotel. The car ate up the entrance ramp, spat them out onto the Visa Angelina Jolie beltway. Three born bad souls in a shiny red slingshot. It was the perfect day for this. The sun was out in white hot splendor. Cars upon cars skimmed down the beltways beaten asphalt like water bugs. The wind cooled over their scalps, which flared hot with badness and moved their hair around. And they were bad and pound and pounding on the side of the car, hooting and screaming at the terrified other motorists, darting in and out of traffic, high on the tails of the cars in front of them, honking the horn, the drivers glancing into their rear view mirrors and seeing this vehicle with three wide-eyed teenage goons hanging out of it, smiling and cackling like they did not give a damn who lived and who died themselves included. Life to them, not anything worth cherishing or even thinking too much about because it could vanish so easily, which to them made it not precious but cheap, just something occurring in the moment for the time being due to factors aligned by the hand of no one in particular, something that in time will be replaced by other occurrences caused by the aligning of other factors those two by no hand. The driver seeing them in their rear view mirrors swerving on their bumpers and intimidated and scared, moving out of their way so they could pass, receiving for their trouble a glob of discolored spit on the windshield or a view of hairy ass. The owner's hands opening and closing the cheeks like a sideways feculent mouth or still lit cigarette butt hurtling end over end in through the window and obscene insults and gestures as the maniac car passed and disappeared to do the same to somebody else. He did not know where he was going, only that he was going. But as he drove, only he drove, no one else, he felt the energy and excitement of being young and raging and driving. Time was endless. The world was without edges. He was driving west. It was as he sped along the breakdown lane at more than twice the speed limit, nearly clipping the concrete barriers there. The warm wind, the old city of Centerville burning first on all sides of them, then behind them for good. Cars honking and tires squealing from other cars driven by nobodies that a plan began to formulate itself in his will. He was going to see Second America. He was going to find Second America, stamp his feet on Second America, stab the staff of his white flittering flag into Second America, look out over the Second American Valley below him and claim it all as his own, as is the way in Second America. He'd even claim the wildfires breathing in his fingers. He would scope out what would be the empire of Junior Alvarez, rob Visa banks along the way, 
to make the money necessary to raise a ragtag army of men whom he would lead back to Visa Centerville so that he might topple Uncle Antonio and seize the underworld of Visa Northern Virginia as his own. And he would then have so much money and power that he would have a man not only to drive his car for him, but a second man to park it for him as well. A man not only to carry his luggage for him, but another man to pack it as well. And he would enter through the front door wherever he went for the rest of his life. They would insist he do so. He would never lay eyes on a back door again. He would not only have power and money, but also respectability. But he would not be satisfied with Visa Northern Virginia. From there, he would move into Visa Baltimore and take over that city as well. From Visa Baltimore, Visa Wilkesbury, capital of Visa Pennsylvania. From Visa Wilkesbury, Visa New York. From Visa New York, Visa Chicago. From Visa Chicago, Visa Butte, that western epicenter. Then south to vast, glamorous Visa Provo, mighty Visa Phoenix Island, Visa Chihuahua. Then east again, Visa Albuquerque, Visa Dallas, Visa Jackson, Tennessee, and all the rest along the way. It would not be easy. It would not be quick. It would not be clean. It would take years of relentless, slow-burning war. But he would do it. Inch by inch, he'd creep. When it was over, he would rule the nation. He'd go down in history. One of history's great leaders. There were no limits once you stopped being ordinary. This goal, this single purpose, etched itself into his will here on this day, and it never left. His old life and all the humiliations and fears and compromises its future held were all off and burning away. He could feel the ashes on his nose and the heat of the wildfires on his face from the burning as he lit a tobacco company and turned the radio up and looked over at Fernando in the passenger seat who was shouting something and turning in his seat with his pants down to show his brown-black asshole to the motorists in the next lane. They'd follow him anywhere, especially if money and violence were involved. He took Visa Interstate 66 West. Just beyond the state line, he exited and pulled into the first bank branch he saw. They all hopped out and ran inside, screeching in the silence of a bank in a small town in the middle of a weekday afternoon. They had no guns. He put his hand in his jacket pocket. Fernando and Diego assaulted the security guard while Junior approached the teller, a pregnant woman, greeted her and told her in a calm voice that he had a gun and to give him a big bag filled to the top with money or he'd execute her. She obeyed. They left with $110,000. It took 43 seconds. Could not believe how easy it was, how good it felt, how right. They continued west for an hour or so before pulling off again and robbing another one. They ditched the car and stole a late year car company blue sedan. Bought shotguns and ski masks at a huge retail store somewhere, then used them to rob a bank on the other side of town. As he drove off after that, he could feel himself being consumed by a dangerous impulse. He saw himself objectively, knew he was not thinking, was only feeling, perhaps so that he would not feel the fear that he knew was inside him and was only increasing with every mile he drove. The plan over these last wild hours had taken almost physical form in his will. It seemed to project out in front of him on the other side of the windshield as he drove on the interstate. There it was, a creature that now and again crawled out from beneath the car's hood to perch atop it like a gargoyle, presenting itself for Junior's examination 
if for no other reason than to let him put on a parade of rational thinking for himself. But he could not slow down. He could not stop, even though he knew how reckless he was being. He could only ride this groove, no matter what the outcome. Being a young man and being strong-willed and being afraid drove all that night, all the way through it in its entirety. No banks were open, so they robbed Visa 24-hour gas stations and all-night diners to fulfill his raging impulses. He drove and robbed in a good-feeling admixture of crime and hurt and dutiful ambition. The new design of his will, which had created itself hours earlier on the beltway, was still there before his eyes. It was there the entire time, as it would be for the rest of his life. He stuck to Visa I-66, which was also called, according to the Visa Highway Commission signs on the roadsides, the Mother Road. The Mother Road stretched from the magnificent Oceana of the Visa Nevada coast all the way east across the country to Visa Easton, Visa Maryland, where the road trickled out at a Visa roller skating rink. They robbed banks along it, headed west over the course of the following three days. It was a spree of, v of amphetamine crime. He knew Uncle Antonio was looking for him. He knew the police were looking for him. He tried to make himself slow down and think clearly, fearing that if he did not, he would lose control and destroy himself if he had not already. But he could not. Maybe he did not want to. Maybe he wanted only to rob and drive, no matter what the outcome, until he had revenged the world for the hurt he felt, so that the hurt would leave him and be replaced by the physicality of the designs in his will having come to fruition. The only time they stopped, and it was not to rob a bank or to feed themselves at a, va at a fast food restaurant on the side of the interstate, was in the town of Walmart, Ohio. They were intrigued by an enormous stone cat in the distance. They pulled off at something called Visa Garfield National Historic Site. Some kind of ruins. The tour guide explained that the cat was eight stories high and that it dated back to the Information Revolution era, maybe even earlier, they could not be sure because damage caused by the world's near annihilation had affected the substance such that it tainted science's ability to measure its age. There was some disagreement among historians over what it was built for or what it represented. Was it a god? All they knew was that his name was Garfield. <laughs> this was etched in English at the base of, of the statue. The tour guide said it was most likely a religious shrine, the central location of a bizarre Christian ritual. Humans were sacrificed here, the tour guide said. It happened in a peculiar, brutal manner. A citizen was made to stand in the shadow of the Garfield. It was a man or a woman or a child. A horde of his or her fellow Christians was then amassed before him or her. Then coveted objects, such as computers, televisions, microwaves, other valuable, usually entertainment-related merchandise, were piled on the other side of the person, so that the person stood between the horde and the merchandise. At the command of the priest conducting the ritual, the horde then stamped toward the pile of merchandise, each wanted very much to be the first to the pile because they were allowed to buy at a discount whatever they could take. The result was mayhem. The sacrificee was trampled to death. The horde paid no attention as they fought and bit and clawed one another over the markdown merchandise. Then the dead trampled body was dragged off somewhere and another sacrificee was brought out. A fresh pile of merchandise was arranged. 
a new horde was amassed. The ritual was repeated. Junior asked what this ritual was called. The tour guide said, Christmas. <laughs> so, thank you.